Welcome to OEN Engaged. Thank you so much for joining us for the Open Pedagogy Train the Trainer Workshop. My name is Tanya Groz. I'm an older blonde woman uh, wearing a blue shirt. We are delighted to have you here today, and we thank you for the work that each of you and our community does to make education more equitable, accessible, and affordable through open education. As we begin the session, I'd like to share a few important details with you. Uh, this session is being recorded, and as such, all attendees are muted. The video, transcripts, and slides will be sent to all registrants and to the OEN Google Group after the event has concluded. Videos will also be posted on the Community Hub. Um, we are thankful to have ASL interpreters here at the session. As such, we invite speakers to say their names before speaking to help facilitate the interpretation process. We have allotted time at the end of today's session for questions, but it's a three-hour session, so please feel free to enter your questions in the chat anytime you have them. Um, Barb Thies um, is monitoring the chat today. We are committed to providing a friendly, safe, and welcoming environment for all attendees. You can learn more about our community norms at, um, at z.umn.edu slash OEN community norms. Please join us in creating a safe and constructive space. The hashtags for OEN Engage are hashtag OEN Engage 23 and hashtag more connection. Join us on Twitter at, at OpenEd underscore network. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Whitman, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am a white woman with dark hair wearing a white striped shirt. Uh, today, we're going to be using Menti so we can connect with each other and engage in these discussions around open pedagogy. You can join us here in Menti by going to menti.com and entering the code you see on the screen, which is 71990310. You can scan the QR code on the screen, or you can follow us using this link. Uh, once you get there, you should be able to click on the little thumbs up icon and let us know that you're in. All right, I see people starting to join. Thank you, Jamie. This is Tanya again. Before we begin, the OEN is housed at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, which is located on traditional, ancestral, and contemporary lands of Indigenous people. The university resides in Dakota land seated in the treaties of 1837 and 1851. We acknowledge this place has a complex and layered history. This land acknowledgement is just one of the ways in which we work to educate the campus and community about this land and our relationship with it and each other. We are committed to ongoing efforts to recognize, support, and advocate for American Indian nations and peoples. And we thank the Dakota people for their persistence through a violent history. Please feel free to acknowledge the indigenous people to whom the land you are situated on um, in the chat if you feel so inclined. So today, um, we are going to be establishing a, a basic foundation of open so that we're all on the same page. Um, we're going to be transitioning into the actual intro to open pedagogy workshop that was designed for faculty. Um, and I might be stopping sometimes, um, you know, to go a little bit more meta to talk about it, and I might just go through it. So we'll see how that works. It's the very first time we've offered that, as well as this workshop. Uh, we will have a small group breakout. We will take a break. Um, it's a third, you know, it's a three-hour session. Um, we will then transition into facilitating and actually experiencing an open pedagogy learning circle. We will take a break after that. Um, we'll give you some examples, go through the curriculum of the learning circles, um, uh, make sure that you feel comfortable getting started running your own learning circle um, and any lessons learned. Um, and we'll do another small group breakout and take some questions. Um, now briefly, uh, thanks for those um, land acknowledgements in, in the chat. Um, I'd like to give you a little bit more information about the Open Education Network, who exactly is in our network and our goals as well as our values. We're not a vendor. We are a diverse network of higher ed institutions working together to make hi higher education more affordable, equitable, and accessible. 
We represent more than 1,600 member campuses across the United States and Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom who strive to make higher ed more open. Specifically, the OEN is focused on action that advances open education in ways that are shareable, collaborative, and sustainable. We do this by sharing the experiences and expertise of our community in ways to support our members. As a community, we are working together to help everyone in higher education. The best example of our efforts to support the common good is the Open Textbook Library, a comprehensive library of open textbooks reviewed by faculty that make open textbooks freely available to anyone, anywhere, at any time. Ultimately, we're thinking of and trying to address something even bigger, and that is the advancement of educational equity through resources and practices that are more affordable, more accessible, and more inclusive. So now we'd like to know a little bit more from you. If you consider adding your name, title, and where you're from, and if you'd like why you're here in the chat, uh, we'd love to know a little bit more about who's attending this session. And once again, welcome. While I'm waiting for people to um, put their information in the chat, uh, let me go over what today is going to look like a little bit um, and kind of to situate you in, into the expectations for today. Jamie, if you could advance the slide, please. We want you to make yourself comfortable. Uh, we do invite you to have your cameras on, but feel free to leave them off if you prefer. Um, please place questions in the chat if you would at any point. Uh, while we do have two scheduled breaks, if you need to refill your coffee or run to the restroom or do whatever, we just want you to take care of yourself and feel comfortable. Also, we want you to let we want to let you know that this is indeed the first time we're giving this workshop. So we really value and appreciate your candid feedback. You all, our community, kept telling us that you needed more support around open pedagogy. So this year, uh, we rolled out a certificate program in open educational practices. We created a faculty workshop, which is encompassed today within this workshop. And we also offered open pedagogy learning circles um, created by the OEN fellow this year, uh, the lovely Amanda Larson from Ohio State University. And we'll share that with you today. So we really um, are striving to meet your needs and we thank you in advance for uh, your honest feedback. So seeing people from Texas, from East Carolina, from, um, oh, hi, Joe, welcome, Michelle of South Carolina, from Lewis, welcome, Emily, Smith College, Buena Vista, Boulder, Colorado, all over. Bryn Athen College, hi, Carol. So welcome, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm Tanya Groes, I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the Open Ed Network. Prior to this role, I was a Dean at a small liberal arts university where I started and ran an open education initiative. My PhD is in education and online teaching and learning and I still teach online literature every semester. I have two grown daughters, one who just got engaged, a husband of 30 years who's a basketball coach, and I have two schnauzers that are extremely spoiled, and you will likely hear from them over the course of this workshop. Go ahead, Jamie. Hi again, everyone. Uh, my name is Jamie Whitman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Open Educational Practices Specialist with the OEN. Uh, before coming to the OEN, I was the online learning and OER librarian at a community college in Maryland. And while I was there, I established the Affordable Textbook Program um, and led the Open Pedagogy Fellowship Program. And when I'm not working, I love to be outdoors, especially hiking with my husband, our kids, and our dog. So now that we've all introduced ourselves and said a little bit about ourselves, uh, we just wanted to check in and see how everyone is feeling today. I'm going to put the uh, Q QR code and the code back on the screen, too, um, in case you missed that, and I'll put the link back in the chat, too. Right, some happy, some energetic, lots of curious. Always exciting to see some curious folks out there. Um, some overwhelmed. It's been a long week. Um, this is going to be a long session, so hopefully it doesn't add any any more to that. But um, we hope you'll get a lot of really great information out of it. I go a little bit more. Let's 
be some chill. It's always nice to be relaxed and ready for the day. Right, and then we have just a little bit of a fun question just to um, learn a little bit about what we like. Um, so what is your favorite summer activity? And if it's not in the uh, list, please put it in the chat. The beach any day. Yeah, we've got lots of swimming pool beach fans out here. Ice cream, just relaxing. Um, I already mentioned hiking is my favorite, so that would be me. Staying out of the Texas heat, I could imagine. Yes, definitely. Gardening, biking, tabletop gaming. Oh, those are some really fun activities. Thanks everyone for sharing that with us. Picking berries, Melissa, I've never done that. I, I wanna do that someday. Um, so today, uh, our focus is on open pedagogy. Uh, however, open pedagogy starts with open educational resources and the practices enabled through the use of OER. So I just want to ensure that we're all on the same page foundationally. So we are defining open as free plus these permissions. And these different permissions are to copy, mix, share, keep, or use, or you might be more familiar with the five R's of retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, as David Wiley calls them. Um, in other words, Creative Commons grants us the ability to update content, customize content, and improve content. Um, so we also wanna talk about that pedagogy part. Um, so in terms of the pedagogy, Scholars Wiley and Hilton sought to further narrow and define the concept of open pedagogy, ultimately settling on the term OER enabled pedagogy, which is defined as the set of teaching and learning practices that are only possible or practical in the context of the five R permissions that are characteristic of OER. So building exclusively on the five R's of open that we just talked about, educators can ask the following four questions to better distinguish OER-enabled pedagogy um, from, say, project-based learning. And so those four questions are, are students asked to create new artifacts or revise, remix existing OER? Does the new artifact have value beyond supporting the learning of its author? Are students invited to publicly share their new artifacts or revised, remixed OER? And are students invited to openly license their new artifacts or revised remixed OER? And for several years now, we have been hearing that our members wanted more resources around open pedagogy. Um, and I know as a librarian myself, I have needed and wanted more support around open pedagogy so I could turn around and provide that same support to my classroom faculty colleagues. And open pedagogy can be a scary sort of nebulous space to enter. So we're going to both define it as we walk through the intro to open pedagogy workshop and we'll also look at a few really cool things that open pedagogy does. Uh, but we realize it's not enough to just know open pedagogy can be transformative. So we wanna acknowledge the challenges there will be to talking about or helping faculty with open pedagogy. And we're hoping that the workshop that we're about to model for you, the introduction to open pedagogy workshop. Okay, so I'm gonna to pretend today that you are faculty attending this workshop, which is being given for the first time today. Uh, since we've already done introductions, we're going to skip the introductory stuff that we would normally do uh, in this workshop and go right to the problems facing higher ed slide. So to establish the context of what we're talking about today and why it's important, let's briefly talk about some of the problems facing higher education. While it's certainly not the only problem, as these figures illustrate, cost is still and probably will always remain a problem. And while textbook costs have decreased in the past five years, and we want to acknowledge that, they are still expensive. Um, and some of these, you know, some of these bullet points are still alarming. The fact that average federal student debt um, is over 37,000 per borrower. The fact that private student loan debt averages over 50,000, almost 55,000 per borrower, that average student borrows over 30,000 to pursue a bachelor's degree, that 45.3 million borrowers have student loan debt, 92% of them have federal loan debt, 
and that 20 years after entering school, half of student borrowers still owe 20,000 each on outstanding loan balances. All of that's alarming. And lest we think that, oh, you know, because costs is decreasing, we don't really have to worry about course material costs. Um, as the parent of two college age students, I can tell you it's still an issue. The price of textbook increases by an average of 12% with each new edition. Between 77 and 2015, the cost of textbooks increased over 1000%. I'm sure you've seen that. The increase in the cost of textbooks outpaced currency inflation by 238% from 77 to 2015. From 2002 to 2012, textbook inflation outpaced consumer price growth by 192%. So while it's awesome that we all seem to be more aware of the cost of course materials, and we are implementing affordability initiatives, which is great, uh, I think most of us have experienced or know someone who has experienced the pain of a $200 textbook or what galls me more as a parent, a paying parent, is a $75 access code that expires. Um, or perhaps, and this happened to one of my daughters, you've been, they've been opted into an inclusive access program without fully understanding the implications of it. Um, and these cost problems really impact some students more than others, which is even more alarming. So this is from Shifting Narratives, Centering Race and Defining and Measuring College Values study from TICAS. Um, so this is from 2023. Um, and it's alarming in that the cost problem that we've just very briefly dis uh, discussed, it dis disproportionately affects students of color who go on to earn less income a decade after graduation. Also, the report demonstrates that colleges who have the largest share of Black students indicate that those students owe more in student loans than they originally borrowed. From Balancing Act, a 2023 report from the Lumina Foundation, um, this report suggests that six-year completion rates for any type of degree are lower for Black students than for those in any other racial or ethnic group, and that 21% of currently enrolled Black students say that they feel discriminated against frequently or occasionally at their institution. In addition, there are other factors that challenge Black students, such as the fact that 22% of Black students have caregiver responsibilities versus 11% of all other students or 20% of Black students have full-time jobs as opposed to 11% of all students. So ultimately, if we want education to be inclusive, accessible, equitable, we have to address the areas that patently are not that way. And the problems or barriers we've just covered often lead to an even more alarming one. A study in 2019 declared that racially minoritized and first-generation students at four-year institutions are less inclined to feel that same sense of belonging compared to their peers at two-year institution. So we've talked a little bit about students having to shoulder the burden of tuition costs, textbook costs, as well as the disproportionate effect those barriers might have on students of color. But I also want to consider, for example, the psychological messages we send to students in terms of who belongs and who doesn't belong based on the need to pay for very expensive tuition or to buy a $100 or $200 textbook that likely does not reflect faces that look like theirs. These financial barriers and inability to see themselves in the curriculum can have a direct impact on students' sense of belonging, particularly those who come from historically marginalized backgrounds. These students may feel like they aren't being seen in the classroom. And that's a very brief, very quick overview of the problems because we're all in higher ed and we see these. Um, so I know that I'm just skimming the surface, but let's turn to one possible solution for making education more inclusive, more affordable and more equitable. And it's a solution, not the solution. So based on the challenges we've discussed, and many I'm sure that were missed, let's address one solution, which is open pedagogy. And to be really clear, let's define its parts. Open first, then pedagogy. Because of its Creative Commons licensing, we can see we're an open book that you can do all of these different things with. You can copy, you can share it, you can edit, you can mix, you can keep it, you can use it. 
might address some of the issues earlier, affordability, culturally inclusive curriculum, et cetera. When we enable users to engage with the content in many ways through this type of licensing, we get closer to achieving those more equitable learning outcomes. And we'll unpack some of these examples in much more detail later. So because of the openness of whatever the resource we are working with is, we are moving beyond what we call a disposable assignment, where students do something to achieve an educational objective and whatever's been created is thrown away, right? That's how I taught in the 90s for years, and it's on to the next objective. With open licensing, we can create something that gives back to future students of whatever class we're in. We can take something and we can make it better. We can make it matter. In short, we can do better than a disposable assignment. So basically, these Creative Commons opens licensing and permissions allow us to think outside the box. I like how our friend Rajiv Jangiani suggests that open ped is at the center of these five R's of pedagogical practice. So moving beyond the traditional definition of the five R's of OERs, which are really just a different way of saying copy, share, edit, mix, and use. Rajiv's five R's, uh, respect, reciprocate, risk, reach, resist, um, you know, they uh, are, are teaching us to strive for something better. And I also really like the brief definition of an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education. Another friend of ours, Will Cross, suggests that at its core, open pedagogy is the stuff you can do with an open educational resource. So you can do all those five R's because of the licensing, and that's the open part. You'll find that there are many definitions of open pet. As a matter of fact, I think that's one of the problems. That's one of the obstacles perhaps we need to get uh, over because there are all these definitions. Um, so uh, you know, I'm going to try to grasp onto those definitions that have made sense as I've walked through instructing the, the certificate in open educational practices, and I, as I, as an instructor, have grappled with some of this. Bronwyn Hegarty helpfully laid out the attributes of open pedagogy there on the screen. Uh, Robin DeRosa and Rajiv Jangiani helpfully acknowledged that open ped shares common investments with many other schools of pedagogy, such as constructivist pedagogy, connected learning, crit critical digital pedagogy, um, some people would say um, active, you know, activity-based learning. In addition to defining open pet as an access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education, they also suggest that it's a process of designing architectures and using tools for learning that enable students to shape the public knowledge commons of which they are part. So open pet is a wide open space. Open science folks say that open science is science done well, right? In that same vein, Open education, we think, needs to be more than just free textbooks in order to convince you all to engage. Open ped at its core is pedagogy or the method and practice of teaching done well or maybe done better. Open educational practices and open pedagogy are about sharing in community and about centering student agency. So we started with a simple definition of open ped and access-oriented commitment to learner-driven education. Now let's look at one that's maybe a little bit more pointed. For a comprehensive definition, I personally like this one from BC Campus, which centers student co-creating. Open pedagogy, also known as open educational practices, is the use of open educational resources to support learning. When you use open pedagogy in your classroom, you are inviting your students to be part of the teaching process participating in the co-creation of knowledge. So that's one way of thinking about what open pet does. It invites students to be a part of the teaching process, participating in the co-creation of knowledge. Now, another definition from the University of Texas Arlington Libraries that centers students is that open pedagogy is the practice of engaging with students as creators of information rather than simply consumers of it. It's a form of experiential learning in which students demonstrate understanding through the act of creation. The products of open pedagogy are student created and openly licensed so that, that they may live outside of the classroom in a way that has an um, impact on the greater community. 
So we've seen a, a few definitions of open pedagogy. If you're like, wait a second, I'm not sure I got it. We are going to take you through examples. So hopefully you'll be able to get your arms around it. But you all as educators might be saying, well, what do students think of it? W what do they think of open ped? Well, there's certainly room for growth and additional studies about this, but I think we do have a little bit of a start. According to several studies, students find that open pedagogy is a positive learning experience. Students generally perceive open ped as a positive and meaningful experience. Also, they appreciate developing artifacts that can be used by others beyond the classroom. They expressed appreciation in developing artifacts that could be utilized by others. They appeared to foster pride in their work, likely because they knew it would be seen and potentially utilized and maybe improved by others. They feel agency as scholars. In addition, students reported feeling student, uh, feelings of agency as scholars that they were contributing to a body of knowledge rather than simply consuming what is already known. Um, and then something that um, excites me as a, as a longtime teacher, they developed better critical thinking skills. Um, and, and that makes sense if you think about it, because students had to evaluate sources, they had to synthesize ideas when creating their artifacts, in addition to giving and receiving feedback. Um, evaluating sources and peer feedback aren't unique to open ped, but these techniques may be important for successful open pedagogy. Um, and so I thought that was kind of an exciting um, discovery. Thank you, Tanya, for sort of grounding us in open pedagogy and giving us a way to think about it and what it is and what it can be. Um, and so we wanted to pause really quickly and see, is there anything in this overview of open pedagogy that really resonates with you as an instructor? And I'll put the code back on the screen in case you need it again, and I'll put the link back in the chat. So applying what they're learning to create something for others, empowering students to co-create the course itself, centering students, critical thinking skills, students as agents of their own learning paths, students like to be needed, experiential learning, scroll down here, student ownership, students feel more engaged and wanting to do their best work, assignments that have meaning, students as creators in their own right, students developing critical thinking skills. It looks like we're all um, really capturing those same pieces that resonate students having agency and students as creators, developing skills that move beyond just that one assignment in this one particular classroom. Engagement with the larger community, students as contributors to the field in real time, access oriented, learner driven, and students in community with each other and with educators. and that they overlap with other ped pedagogies that are already used. So it might be easy to sort of move into open pedagogy if you're already focused on problem-based education or um, activity-based. Students having a bigger reason to do the work than just the grade, definitely. And students pride in their work. Thanks everyone for sharing those um, thoughts with us. It really helps us to see, you know, what really resonates with you. And I think it's the same that uh, really resonates with me and Tanya too, as we've been putting this together and thinking about how we can offer these resources on open pedagogy. So now that we've spent some time defining open pedagogy and talking about its attributes and what it does, uh, we wanna look at some actual examples of open pedagogy. Um, so as we, do, as we do, I'll also highlight the ways in which these examples um, attempt to make learning more equitable and inclusive. So this first example is a Wikipedia assignment that was developed for a course on gender and technology at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and so part of what motivated the instructors to engage their students this way was the fact that women, and especially women who have made notable achievements in the STEM fields, are underrepresented on Wikipedia. Um, so this assignment was a, a really perfect opportunity for the instructors to not only provide students with experience in public writing, but also to tackle hands-on the questions of gender inequality and social justice concerns that this course addressed. 
And so this assignment, it really centers inclusivity and in that it highlights an underrepresented class in the field and it engages students as co-creators in knowledge. Um, and additionally, as we know, Wikipedia is widely available and used every day. So the, the student's work was able to be shared with a huge audience. I mean, it really has a global impact beyond just this one course. This next assignment from Maricopa Community College titled A Celebration of What You Know was created to give students the choice of how to complete their final project for the course. So the format option was left completely up to the students uh, to ensure that it aligned with their skill set. And this process was also scaffolded throughout the semester to allow students the opportunity to think critically about how they will be able to present their mastery of key aspects of the course in a way that was meaningful for them. Um, and additionally, students participated in a peer review process, which allowed them to explore other topics from the course and see each other as creators. So this assignment design, it centers student agency and choice while also creating active participants in knowledge creation. Um, because students had the opportunity to showcase their final projects to their peers, they got to see each other as knowledge creators. Um, in addition, assignments like this get at that sense of belonging that we talked about. They say to students that the instructor cares about their opinions and values their voice. This assignment from Kennesaw State University titled Annotating the North Star gives students the opportunity to move away from a traditional discussion board call and response type of assignment to participating in social annotation. Students work together to create meaningful annotations for the North Star, creating a more vibrant and accessible version of this historical newspaper. Uh, and this assignment is used in a cross-listed course, so students from different disciplinary backgrounds contribute to the annotation annotations, which adds additional layers of context and discussion. And so this assignment design gives students the opportunity to be active participants in knowledge creation. Um, and additionally, new students will continue to work on this, this project of annotating the North Star semester over semester to create a fully annotated version, which is then going to be housed in the institutional repository. Um, so again, this type of far-reaching assignment builds students' enthusiasm and increases meaningful participation. And so this, in this next example, um, students actually co-designed their syllabus with their instructor. And so while the instructor had to follow the um, typical, the approved course description and objectives and sort of wrote that preliminary syllabus, the class collaboratively generated their student learning outcomes and the expectations for themselves and the instructor. And co-creating the student learning outcomes helped the instructor understand uh, several things about her students, which was what the students were interested in, what they thought was important, and how limited their sense of the material was. So this instructor, she really intentionally centered the student experience and was highlighting their agency by giving them the chance to shape their own learning outcomes. Uh, in addition, by inviting them into the process at such an early level, she demonstrated that she really values their contributions and she was able to create a more engaged community of learners. And by leaning in and paying attention to her students' area of interests and lack of understanding, um, she was able to make a more inclusive and engaging learning environment. So this next example has students writing questions for a question bank. Uh, Professor Rajiv Jangiani had students write multiple choice questions uh, over the semester for his social psychology class. And wanting to encourage the kind of deep learning that would allow students to both synthesize and understand the subject matter well enough to write these multiple choice questions was the main reason, but also for the pragmatic purpose because the open textbook he was using didn't have a ready-made question bank. And so by asking his students to craft and then peer review multiple choice questions, and by scaffolding that process throughout the semester, uh, Professor Giangiani experienced students who were encouraged and motivated. Um, and furthermore, this assignment contributed to the discipline because now this open textbook did include a question bank. Students in other courses could use the question bank to practice their own skills and prepare themselves for exams. And renewable assignments like this one create higher levels of intrinsic motivation in students, which often leads to higher levels of success. And assignments like this, again, help to deconstruct those traditional power structures. 
When students are able to create, it's telling students that they are smart enough to write test questions and centering their sense of agency and belonging. And finally, this book, An Ecological Approach to Obesity and Eating Disorders, is an example of open pedagogy. This OER is the work of students of Clemson University's Public Health Sciences in collaboration with Clemson Libraries. And the students wanted it to be an information guide, an information guide on various weight-related challenges for the public. And so they led the creation of this textbook. They divided the chapters amongst themselves, and each person peer-reviewed all the chapters and provided feedback, which allowed for deeper understanding of the core content. Uh, and the instructor reported that at the end of the semester, the feedback from the students was overwhelmingly positive. And so this assignment and all of the examples mentioned, again, helps to elevate and center the student voice and experience, saying to students that they matter. So as you've seen from these examples, thank you for that, Jamie, open pedagogy has many benefits. Here are just a few in review. Um, it centers student agency. And I know we keep saying that, but I think that's one of the most powerful things about open ped. It gives students the opportunity to shape their own learning and participate in the learning process on a more equal and individualized basis. Not that I'm saying it's easy, um, I'm not trying to convey that to you, but that it's empowering to them. In these examples, students are editing Wikipedia to make it more inclusive and truthful. They are determining what their syllabus will look like. They are writing questions for their exams, and they're actually writing a textbook that will help other students. Also, it deconstructs traditional power structures. Instead of that sage on the stage that leaves you with such a gap between you and the student, um, in open pedagogy, the professor is facilitating a learning experience with students' interest and choice and background in mind. Um, certainly, I think open ped allows for deeper learning. In order to write those quiz questions, students have to synthesize that information and understand it well enough to actually write good questions. Um, and the students who co-write the textbook on obesity and eating disorders had to understand the information well enough to write coherently about it. Talk about deep and active learning. It invites students to be co-creators in knowledge because they actually got to experience the form and structure and process of writing a textbook, which they can then put on a resume or CV and carry forward into later life. Open PEG contributes to knowledge beyond an assignment or classroom, um, as opposed to assignments that are completed, graded, thrown away, never thought about again. The examples we've shared are all contributing to a body of knowledge that will be used long after the particular class is over. It's very real world and renewable as opposed to disposable. We saw how open ped creates a more inclusive learning environment. Students are invited to use their backgrounds, their cultural context, as they participate in creating a textbook or updating Wikipedia or constructing a syllabus. And finally, open ped demonstrates transparency on the part of the instructor. It encourages us as faculty to rethink what learning should look like. It opens up new doors of collaborating with our students, inviting them into the learning experience. And I think it can be transformative. It can also, I think, help us in our attempt to put into practice the principles of social justice. So Professor Jasmine Roberts from Ohio State University helped to clarify each of these principles of social justice in this slide by showing us how open ed addresses the three principles um, as described by Sarah Lambert. So in that all these projects were openly licensed, OER as content helps us to apply redistributive justice, ensuring that our students have free and perpetual access to the learning materials we provide. It addresses recognitive justice in that we know that not all learning materials are of the same quality, particularly when it comes to presenting socio-cultural diversity, perspective, and experiences. As we've seen, open ped allows opportunities for faculty and students to be co-creators of culturally affirmative learning materials by revising and remixing existing OER or by encouraging learners who have been historically underserved and under underrepresented to contribute their own experiences, perspectives, and stories to the learning materials. Finally, there is power in authorship and in construction of learning resources, and OpenPED 
suggests that it's not just me as professor who should be constructing the curriculum. And instead, we are inviting students in, we are centering their agency and their voice for a more inclusive classroom. And I think that's pretty exciting. So if you wanna know how to get started uh, with OpenPED, um, here are some next steps. So you could watch this excellent hour long video given by a copyright expert, a librarian and a faculty member who are all open pedagogy practitioners. That would be an excellent next step. Oh, thanks, Jamie. Um, you could also, um, you could also uh, sign up for this learning circle uh, interest list. So once a semester, we will we'll be facilitating a learning circle and open pedagogy where you will be creating a renewable assignment. And then when the seven week long learning circle is completed, we will be facilitating a workshop that gives anyone interested all of the curriculum and tips to run your own learning circle. So if you'd like to sign up, there's the interest list. Also, uh, this past year, we had the exciting opportunity to run the Certificate in Open Educational Practices as funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. We're waiting on the next round of funding. Uh, fingers crossed. The next session will run in the spring of 2024. This program takes faculty and librarian pairs. It provides a facilitated online course about open educational practices. And it has these pairs implement an open pedagogy project on their own campus in their own classroom. The pilot uh, was awesome. It saw some truly wonderfully transformed curriculum through the power of open ped. Thank you, Jamie, for putting the link in the chat about how to sign up if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, and then, uh, you know, note to you librarians, we have really done our best to provide a variety of resources and opportunities to engage with open ped, but we want to know what are we still missing. We are working on an open pedagogy student toolkit, uh, just so you know, that any faculty member could give to students as they practice open pedagogy together. Later on, we'll give you the opportunity to complete a brief anonymous survey to tell us what else you need. Um, but in the meantime, please check out our beautifully redesigned website, which has some really great uh, resources for open pedagogy. Um, so after now that you've seen the intro to open pedagogy workshop, how do you feel about your ability to offer it to faculty if you'd um, answer that Minty question? Love to see some ready to goes and the enthusiastics out there. And it's definitely okay to still be curious. There's lots to know about open pedagogy and it's a lot to wrap your head around um, and get, get ready to really offer it. Marinda, um, thank you for that question in the chat. Um, my estimation, again, this is the first time we've offered it. My guess is that it would be 45 to 55 minutes with some time for questions. So we're striving at least for that hour mark. Um, you know, so that that was our intention. And I, I really love that you mentioned, Marinda, that you want to adapt it too. So remember that this is available to be altered to your institution and make it uh, more focused on what you need for your institutional context. Rita, I think your point is so well taken. I could work through the content, but answering their questions may be harder. I feel exactly the same way. Um, and undoubtedly, some of you are going to ask us questions about open ped that we're like, mm, we're not sure about. Um, and so what my boss, Dave, taught me is that it's OK to say, I'm not sure. I'll look into that. Or wonderful community, can you help us answer those questions? Open pet is still new. It's still somewhat nebulous. And I think as an educator anyway, it's a little scary. So I think it's okay not to have the answers. I think the important thing is to put it in front of faculty and say, here's an option and I'm willing to help you. <clears throat> And we're going to get into the learning circles um, in a little bit, but the learning circles can be um, focused for just faculty. It could also be faculty support folks. Um, so it could be instructional designers, librarians, um, administration. 
Um, so it's it's really up to you how you'd like to run that, um, but we'll definitely go over that in more detail once we get to the facilitating an, op uh, an open pedagogy learning circle section. Um, Melissa, good questions about the certificate and OEP. Um, uh, once it is no longer under IMLS funding and the OEN absorbs it as just one of our programs that we run, we um, are looking forward to including instructional designers and other educators. Um, because it's the Institute of Museum and Library Services, that's why it's librarians um, for these, this first round. Um, and thank you, Amanda. Uh, Amanda, the creator of our learning circles, is clarifying that the learning circles can be run for faculty support staff or both together, which is what we did and we found it rich, and we'll talk about that later. Absolutely, Miranda is suggesting that we should offer an FAQ document. I think you're right, we should. So we know that um, as you go to offer this um, intro to open pedagogy workshop, there might be some challenges that you're going to end up facing. Um, and so we'd like to know, can, is there any that you can think of right now that you might face as you engage faculty in open pedagogy? Faculty short on time. I'm sure that one will, will pop up several times in, in this as a challenge. Resistance to change professional development fatigue, faculty buy-in, it's always about time, time constraints, um, faculty seeing it as more work for them, motivating faculty attendance, faculty are fearful, fearful of ceding control to students and unpredictability of outcomes makes many nervous. Getting admin to support it, finding a working schedule with other departments and workload, your own workload, that is definitely something to take into consideration. We can't always be everything for everyone all at once. Um, no time. Not feeling confident in talking about pedagogy to instructor instructors who do it all the time. And that's a that's a really tricky one. I know myself as a librarian, that's always a hard sort of a line to walk. Um, you know, it always feels like that's not something I can give advice on necessarily, but. Um, I think that we we can be confident in, in talking to classroom instructors and classroom faculty. Um, open pedagogy open pedagogy is just another top down thing. Mindset asking students to do their jobs. Uh, imagine faculty wanting to explore the examples for reinforcement, understanding, and ask questions as they do that. So possibly extending the workshop time to allow that. Lack of models for faculty. Faculty are not usually taught pedagogy in their programs. Inability to create financial resources to incentivize faculty. Um, that's always a, a tough one too, especially with that lack of time, the different time constraints that everybody has on them. And so uh, what we'd like to do now, so now that we've all um, you've all listed some of these different challenges that you might come up with. Uh, we're going to break into breakout rooms, um, and we'd like for you to pick two or three of these um, barriers and brainstorm some solutions for them. Um, so I'm going to leave this slide up now, and if you're in Menti, you should still be able to see all of these different results. Uh, but we're going to go off into breakout rooms um, so you can see if there's any solutions that you might be able to come up for, come up with for some of these. You can share in the chat if you'd like, if you'd like to unmute. But yeah, we, you know, anyone want to share first? Any, anyone have something interesting as far as solutions or maybe some more challenges that you came up with? I can share one thing that got my attention. I, it might be a further down the line idea, but similar to how we're seeing a lot more course markings. Um, uh, in place for things like zero cost um, courses or zero textbook cost courses or Z degrees or whatever you know they're called, it would be interesting to be able to do some sort of course marking for open pedagogy. Hmm. Um, it's a pretty cool idea. That is a pretty cool idea. 
Um, Melissa said, find a champion, help them build something awesome. Um, that's what my group kind of focused on initially, like, okay, start small. Somebody who's adopted an open textbook might be the person who would be willing to try this. Hand those conversations over to leadership instead of having the conversation ourselves, or at least uh, ensure that you affirm public support from administration, use a familiar liaison, offer awards for performance, use course markings, which um, uh, you just shared, um, think about terminology, renewable assignments, or something with less jargon. Yep. Um, you know, uh, another thing that um, brought, was brought up in our group is that maybe we need to take a second, take a beat to talk about open access and define it a little bit um, so that people don't conflate open access with open ed. And we just make sure everyone's clear, like foundational definitions. So I thought that was a good note. Um, it's renewable. I use it every year. Okay, that's funny. Yes, maybe we need to rethink that language. Um, anyone else want to either unmute or or put some something that you shared in the chat that might be helpful to the rest of us? Time issues for faculty. Have them build their plan in an open pedagogy workshop, including, oops, including their rubrics and work through some of those potential problem areas so they feel more confident. I love that, Teresa. Um, you know, way back in 2009, when my provost wanted me to run a blended learning thing, we held a workshop and we worked through some of this and we gave faculty time and we incentivized them a little bit. So, you know, I think that's a good idea, you know, uh, putting them in a room, giving them some time to work out some of these issues while you're there. Um, Trisha, I was at a conference last year and the panel ended up having to do all the open definitions for a large part of the audience. You know, I think uh, those of us who have worked in open now, maybe for a decade or more, we forget there are still people who don't know what open is, what open educational resources are. So it is worth taking the time, I think, to make sure that we all have the same foundation. So thank you for that. Anybody else? Okay, well, hopefully the workshop gave you at least some ideas for, okay, this is what maybe a starting point. We will continue to refine it with your feedback um, and the more we give it, but also later on after the break, we're going to model some learning circles and that hopefully will be yet another resource for you to get people interested and to get people engaged in open pedagogy. Um, before we break, uh, we talked about building open ed into the conversations we're having with faculty about improving course outcomes. Um, not as much emphasis on open ed, but using open ed structure to help them build. Love that. Um, and we're going to talk later about um, an uh, open ped repository, which is a new thing we have that we're building into. Um, so that if you're a lit teacher like me and you go, what does open ped look like in my discipline? You have examples. So I'm really excited to talk about that as well. In the meantime, let's go ahead and take a break and get a little bit of refreshment before we dive into learning circles. So welcome back from your break. Um, we know that uh, we knew going into it that we would need different options for professional development around open pedagogy. Um, we knew that people wouldn't necessarily want to join a year-long uh, cohort uh, for a certificate, um, and that some might want a short-term community like the one offered in a learning circle that spans seven one-hour-long sessions, so over seven weeks. Our pilot of this was really successful. Shout out to Jamie and to Amanda Larson. And we are eager to pass along what we have created and learned to you. Um, so before we get um, moving with the facilitating an open pedagogy learning circle, we actually have so many slides that we had to create a second mentee um, to be able to use it to engage with each other. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, link in the chat. And then again, you can go to menti.com and enter the code that's on the screen um, or scan the QR code. And I'll continue to add the link and pull up the code and QR code as we move through the slides. Let me get the link in the chat for you.
So why did we choose to do a learning circle? Well, there are many reasons we chose to have our OAN fellow for 2023, Amanda Larson, devote her time to this. Uh, we piloted an 18-person learning circle with faculty, instructional designers, administrators, and librarians this spring for the first time. Um, we know that a facilitated learning circle experience can help to form community. Shout out to Karen Pakula from the Minnesota State System. She is the kind of the original, the OG, as my kids would say, of learning circles, and we learned a lot from her. Um, <clears throat> during our pilot, we really loved how the people stepped in to answer each other's questions and the different experiences and roles really complemented each other. Because we used slide decks and had someone facilitating, it was pretty low stakes. You didn't have to talk if you didn't want to, but we hoped participants wanted to engage and they did. Uh, the nature of open pedagogy itself is very collaborative. It's really an intentional centering of student agency experience as we've talked about. So taking time to talk about the key issues surrounding and involved in open ped hopefully made participants a little more confident about trying it out in their own classrooms. Um, also, the OEN wants to equip others to do what we do, uh, teaching you to fish kind of thing. So all of our curriculum is openly licensed. We know you have your own institutional setting and you may want to use some of our curriculum, but adapt it um, or maybe not use other pieces. And that's why we create it and give it to you with some tips and tricks. Learn from us, but then we want you to go make your own learning circle however you'd like to do it. <clears throat> Pardon me. So <clears throat> some of our goals for the Learning Circle experience were to create the curriculum for the Learning Circle featuring open pedagogy topics, to create a scaffolded assignment that allows uh, folks to do open pedagogy, to build a community learning about open ped comprised of instructors and instructor support roles, and then to create training that will help others facilitate a Learning Circle at their own institution. <clears throat> Someone is unmuted, so if, if somebody could take a look at that, that'd be helpful. Um, some learning circle considerations. As you consider running your own learning circle, we want to make you aware of some big things to consider ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> Amanda and I took some time to really research best practices for learning circles, and we kept seeing the numbers between 10 to 12 people. We decided to allow 18 because we thought there would be attrition, and we were right. During most synchronous sessions, about eight or nine people attended and participated, which ended up being beautiful. We had a very simple application process that we will share with you, but we wanted to make it clear that attendance and a final project or product were expected um, in order to get the digital certificate at the end. We intentionally wanted faculty and staff to participate because of the crosstalk and sharing of ideas, so we did that intentionally. Uh, there was a lot to get through in seven hours and weeks. Shout out to Amanda for getting through it all. We were really thankful for Menti, which we're using here, because that really aided engagement and community formation. <clears throat> but we wish we would have had some more open mic time for participants to just speak without looking at the clock so quickly. So we needed a little bit more time. We modeled and utilized some carefully chosen tools and why we'll share all of that with you. You may very well wanna choose different tools to support the practice of open ped, those tools that are supported on your campus. Um, and then we took some time to research about 12 different resources on learning circles. And that was helpful because it provided us some, found out, some foundational thoughts on best practice and gave us kind of a framework from which to run. <clears throat> As you plan to facilitate, um, based on our experience, we recommend a few pra practices. Um, we, we'd encourage you to consider consistent opening and closing activities. We took advantage of Menti to have fun and engaging questions. We emailed participants with some pre-work that usually consisted of a reading and brief viewing. We knew that they weren't all going to do it, but those uh, who did were really richly prepared. We consciously use tools that might be used when engaging with open ped like Menometer, Hypothesis, Google Docs, et cetera. We offered some time to reflect upon learning each session um, and that was helpful. We wanted them to create something practical and we'll talk about that in a second. And we offered consultations for those who wanted to talk through their final project or just any questions they had with Jamie and some people um, really valued that time. 
So now we're going to stop and pretend we're actually experiencing the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle, um, just like we did with the Intro to Open Ped Workshop, uh, where we acted as though we were giving it to you as faculty members. So this is as if you are participants in the Learning Circle. And so the goals for um, actually facilitating a learning circle is that we really want you to get a feel for what the learning circle was like for participants, um, how we centered community building, engagement, and communication through the use of polling and share outs. Um, and we hope that experiencing the learning circle session for yourself will help you determine whether this type of activity fits your institution and your own goals centered around open pedagogy. And so some background information on the ses sessions themselves, each learning circle session follows the same structure. It begins with opening activities, followed by discussion activities and a presentation on that week's topic and learning tool, and ends with closing activities and what's next. So the first session of the learning circle actually focuses on what is open pedagogy, definition building, and community norm setting. Um, since we've really already covered the basics of that during the intro to open ped workshop, uh, we're actually going to demonstrate the learning circle with session two, disposable versus renewable assignments. Okay, so we're going to switch into being a participant in the learning circle. So welcome to session two of the open pedagogy learning circle. Today we are going to be discussing disposable versus renewable assignments. And so here's a look at our agenda for today's session. We'll start with our opening activities and then move on to talking about disposable assignments, renewable assignments, and our tool of the week, FLIP. And then we're going to end with our closing activity and a look at what's next. So here we go. Um, so we always want to check in at the beginning of our session. So how is everyone feeling today? Four chills, one overwhelmed. One curious, a little bit sleepy. I feel the sleepy. I think I'm in between chill and sleepy myself. Um, two happies, but no, nobody is the Energizer Bunny today, and that that's okay. Um, and I'll pull up the code again just in case um, you don't have it and you want to jump into Menti too. And here's our fun question for today. What is your favorite ice cream flavor? And if it's not on the list, please tell us in the chat. Oh, we've got some, some not on the list. Mint chocolate chip, butter pecan, chocolate. And we have one, I don't like ice cream. If you wanna share what you, what you like instead of ice cream, we would love to hear that too. Mint moose tracks ice cream. That sounds pretty good. Mine is actually a combination of the chocolate base with cookies and cream. And we have a we have a local creamery here in Maryland that does it and they call it Maryland Mud. And it, it's the, the best one out there, I think. Chunky monkey, any flavor, that's always that's always a fun one. Deep chocolate peanut butter, tea berry, that sounds really refreshing. Honey lavender, that sounds really good too. All right, well, thanks so much for sharing that with us. Um, so today we're going to be discussing disposable versus renewable assignments. Um, so to get started, let's think about how you might define a disposable assignment. And I'll go ahead and put the link in the chat again. One-time use, definitely will be discarded in the near future. Complete it, submit it, forget it. I like that, that's very, very succinct. Um, assignment does not have lasting application, something that will be never, never be used outside the classroom. Something that once the grade is in, it gets thrown away. One time use only for the student, turn it in and that's it. Student immediately forgets it when it's turned in. Once the student completes it, there's not really any other use for it. 
student does the assignment and it doesn't travel beyond the time period of the lesson or the context of the class. Typical, disconnected to me, jumping through hoops. Something not worth many points, participation check for assessment only. Something that no one ever sees after completion. I think these are excellent definitions um, of what a disposable assignment could be. Um, so let's go ahead and just take a look at one way to describe them, which I think uh, you really hit on in those in your own definitions. Um, so uh, this definition, student assignments are often very transactional in nature, seen only by the instructor for the purpose of demonstrating content mastery and achievement of learning objectives. This closed feedback loop between the student and instructor has been coined disposable by scholars Wiley and Hilton. So I think you really hit on that in those um, example definitions. And I think Wiley in his definition, which is what this quote is citing, has also created that really visual description, uh, which you hit on as well. So the assignment is disposable because once the instructor grows, goes through the grading process, the student gets it back and they toss it in the trash. It has no further meaning beyond that classroom and that grade. So now that we have uh, a definition, why do you think students might be resistant to disposable assignments? Boring, definitely. Meaningless, feels like busy work. It doesn't feel like true learning to them, not purposeful. They believe that it is a waste of their energy time. They know they don't matter ultimately, possibly isn't applicable to their goals. Busy work, unclear expectations, want to compare to others. They feel they are disconnected. No deeper meaning beyond the grade. It's not worth anything in the grand scheme. Busy work doesn't give them agency. Can't see the relevance in their lives. A lot of effort for something they can't reuse. And they cannot connect the, cannot connect the learning to the real world beyond the classroom. High time demand with low personalized return. That's a, that's a really good one to think about. Uh, they can work on autopilot. The professors are not putting in the effort to do something more applicable towards their goals, just sort of redundant busy work. Yeah, I think those those are exactly right. Um, and I know myself as a student, I've always you know felt that way with those types of assignments too, that they're really busy work. Um, it's not relevant to them. No relation between the assignment and their future. Uh, so we know what students might be resistant to. We know um, what the definition of a disposable assignment is. So what would be some actual examples of assignments that are disposable assignments? A quiz. You know, sort of a knowledge check quiz, worksheet, essay, 15 page paper, discussion boards, handouts, multiple choice quiz. Yeah, so we've got lots of worksheets, lots of quizzes in there, research papers, basic research paper, yep, absolutely. Presentations, long paper, non-digital, test, Yeah, I think those are some really great examples of what a disposable assignment could be or what it might look like in a classroom. Um, and so I think um, here are some more examples, and I think you really hit on all of these again, um, you know, discussion boards where students have to answer a question and reply to X number of their peers. Deliverables that just get pitched after class, um, so those printed posters, um, generic five page essays. Reflections without connections to the course materials are ones that lack transparency for why they matter. Um, so I think several of you mentioned that in your reasons for why students might be resistant, right? Um, without having students comment on a reading and make a, you know, making a meaningful connection to the material um, or really showing how the process creates knowledge transfer doesn't really add any value to the student. Um, essays only the student and the instructor see, so ones that aren't scaffolded or they don't see peer review. And same with creating media learning objects that only, you know, an instructor sees. And so it's so important to, 
for students to see each other's work and interact with each other and see each other as the knowledge creators. And then just an overall feeling of assignments that feel like busy work. Uh, so let's switch now and think about renewable assignments. So how would you define a renewable assignment? Based on everything we just talked about with disposable, what would be sort of the other end of the spectrum there? Websites, assignments with real world impact, shared with the world, useful outside of class, useful to future professional growth, an assignment that is applicable in real world situations, disseminated outside the classroom, outside the school, posted publicly, contributes to wider body of knowledge, work that is contextualized by the student, an assignment that lives on beyond this course, uh, either the instructor, the student, or future students will actively use, travels beyond immediate class context, authentic, scaffolded, intended for a broader audience, helps the community, uh, can be used in a professional portfolio. Something shared outside the classroom can be used on a CV or resume. And to be honest, I don't think many of our faculty know what to do with this term. And um, I noticed in the chat too, there was some discussion about um, again, the, the jargon of disposable versus renewable. And I think that it that is a great um, a great thing to think about because um, as, as Amy mentioned, some professors don't like the term disposable um, and wondering if there's any alternative terms that people are using. Um, and I think that that's a really good point to think about it. I've, uh, Gabby, single use assignment, that's a really, I think, way to capture sort of the essence of what we're talking about with disposable without, um, you know, sort of um, adding a pejorative to what a disposable, calling it a disposable assignment. Um, so let's see, it can be re remixed by others and built upon and building on work of previous students with the knowledge that future students will build off of their work too. Um, so here are two definitions of rene for renewable assignments. Um, and I think they both um, really focus on how you can transform all of those examples of the disposable assignments. And I think um, in and your own definitions of renewable assignments, you've really captured what these definitions are saying. So they're providing outside value, engaging in assignments that feel meaningful to a student and could impact their community. These are assignments that we hope students will want to hang on to, or at least be able to transfer those skills to something else as they grow and move on to their other courses and their life. And um, as we talked about in session one, where we defined open pedagogy, these types of assignments, renewable assignments are possible only because they engage in those five R activities. So can you think of any um, specific examples of what a renewable assignment could be? Write a textbook, community resource site, uh, research and data, chemistry to make ice cream, um, update wiki, oral histories, podcast episodes, student created textbooks, writing quiz questions, co authoring a syllabus, infographics, um, question banks, press book chapters. Training videos, FAQs, student created game. Uh, some more for infographics in there, Omeka exhibit. So did I get them all? Wikipedia page editing. So several different Wikipedia options on there, writing textbooks, writing quiz questions. Um, creating training videos, infographics, question banks. Um, so those are some really awesome examples of what a renewable assignment could be. Um, and so here are a couple of other ones. So social annotation of a shared reading, creating anthology excerpts, contributing to an open textbook, writing quiz questions, creating tutorials or other learning objects for their fellow students and or the public, creating a topic website, 
editing Wikipedia entries, or creating lists of common problems or advice for writing after doing peer review of other students' work and self-reflecting on their own. And so I think um, you all mentioned several of those examples in there. And I think what really all of these assignments really work towards giving students meaningful connections to their course materials with a choice in how they interact with them and the ability to share beyond that one singular course. Uh, so moving from disposable to renewable assignments can have a large impact on your pedagogical approach and design to a course. Um, so it's important to think about how you can get started with these renewable assignments. And I think first things first that um, it's okay to start small. Just changing one assignment or even one aspect of an assignment is a great way to start. You don't have to overhaul your entire course all at once to move into renewable assignments. Um, and these types of assignments exist on a spectrum, right? So you might start small by just offering students the opportunity to maybe pick the format they submit the assignment in. And as you get more comfortable with open pedagogy, you can sort of shift the needle further towards a full-blown renewable assignment. The main goal is to create active, authentic assessments that provide students with a choice and the option to do something. Some key pieces to keep in mind are how does this assignment meet your learning outcomes and objectives? What do you want your students to get out of this learning experience? And maybe whether there is a tool that might be useful for the assignment. And even when starting with just a single assignment, it's still so important to think about how you will scaffold it for your students. Uh, this will likely be very new to your students, if not very new to you. Um, so you'll need to consider how you will build in the support structures that your students will need for any new tools or concepts that you'll be using. And your renewable assignment should bring to the center opportunities for knowledge transfer. So let's look at some examples um, for just starting small from moving from disposable to renewable assignments. Um, so one small step would be to take your typical discussion board post assignment and turn it into a social annotation assignment. So when we think about a typical discussion board post assignment, we know that they're pretty prescriptive. Uh, there's no real choice for students built into the posting, and it usually feels like busy work. Um, I know when I was a student, um, I never was really engaged with these assignments, and I know um, in some of my own um, teaching practices, uh, discussion boards have not gone as well as I have would have liked them to. And so converting the discussion board to a social annotation assignment is one way you can go from disposable to renewable. Um, social annotation can be done in a couple of different ways. You could use a tool like Hypothesis to have students annotate directly in their assigned reading, um, or and students could annotate a portion that they might might have struggled with or a portion that they really found meaningful. Um, and one really neat way to do this is a seek and share. Uh, so, so students find another piece of media like an image or a video or even a GIF that relates to the passage. And it's a really fun way for students to engage with the material and share in a way that gives them some choice and agency. Uh, so another example of a renewable assignment is having students create a question bank. In this example from Rajiv Jagiani, he had students create 1,400 questions, which actually took the place of having an exam. And a key part of this was the way in which he scaffolded the quiz question writing. So students were both supported with the types of questions they were writing and consistently building on previous skills. Uh, so now we've defined renewable assignments. Um, we've looked at some examples. So what do you think students would appreciate about renewable assignments? News and portfolio, usefulness, giving back, empowerment, relevance, not busy work, deeper learning, choice, community purpose, they have agency, controller agency, personal, they feel their work matters. Um, so it really gets at that, that sense of belonging. Um, it makes students um, feel involved in their work. It's not busy work. It has relevance to their, to their lives beyond maybe that classroom, real world application. Um, contributing to a larger body of knowledge. Ability to be creative, have that sense of agency.
those are those are really excellent. Um, so I'm going to break from the learning circle experience for just a second so I can provide a little context about the tool talk slide. So each week of the learning circle includes exploring a learning tool that can be used to create renewable assignments or digital learning objects. During the pre-work for each session, there is built-in time for the participants to play around with each tool um, and think about how they might use it in their work. Um, and so there, there will be some questions, uh, just like we would have in a regular session. Um, so feel free to answer the questions about FLIP if you've used it or if you haven't, um, but just so you have an idea of what this tool talk section looks like. Um, so I'm going to go back into the experience now. So the tool for this week is FLIP. FLIP is a free app and learning tool that allows educators to create safe online groups where students can express themselves. FLIP is mostly used for creating short videos, but it can also be just audio or just text. Um, and don't forget to look at the tool documentation for all the links to get started and for some example use cases. All right. So have you used FLIP? Nope, yep. Some no's, some yeses. One maybe. If you have used Flip, what was your experience? And if you haven't used Flip, how could you see yourself using it? It was fun. It made the space personal. Unsure. Um, so um, when you're maybe doing a learning circle um, at your own institution, this would be a place where you could think about your own tools that you have available. Um, so you can make sure that the folks that you're working with have access to everything and you can um, sort of brainstorm ways to use it in your own institutional context. Um, so let students use phone in class to do presentations in asynchronous or synchronous courses. Um, having students ask questions and other students or you answering used in PD courses, easy to share media with short explanation. Um, liked it a lot, but we've had tech issues. That's unfortunate, um, but nice options for feedback and easy to use. It was for intros for OEN, OER librarian certificate. Turned out to be gentler and simpler than I thought it would be. That's always a nice surprise with a new learning tool. Uh, used it for out outreach and had low engagement, maybe would be better with a specific group. So thinking about different ways that you might be able to use it. Um, students can offer each other feedback on drafts, other kinds of projects. Uh, so those are really some um, neat ways to use it. And for those of you have, who haven't used it, um, it is free and open and, and it has a pretty um, low bar for using it. So it might be something you can experiment with and see how it might work for your own uh, context. So we're at the end of our session for this week. So let's check in and see how everyone is doing. So how are you feeling after today's session? Excited? And if, and if you're feeling a different way, please put it in the chat too. Ready to go, confused. Overwhelmed, other put in the chat. Lots of excited and ready to go, so that's always good to see. Um, confused and overwhelmed, we can always get together and, and talk about um, you know, what's going on so we can work together and see how we can help with that and get you into those excited and ready to go to go areas. Oops. Hopeful, that's always a really nice one to see too. All right, and what is one thing you are taking away from today's session? Optimism, I love that. Wonderful tools and means for open education. Open pedagogy can be transformative. Concrete examples of OP, so many options. Ideas for modeling OER pedagogy for my faculty in their unique fields. Possibilities, maybe have student workers design training for other student workers. That would be really cool. Learning new renewable resources to use in class. Creative ways to implement renewable assignments that are student-led, learning-based, and real-world-based. Educational innovation. Don't have to eat the whole elephant. Definitely not. Start small. Work your way through all that needs to be processed. New ideas. Uh, going to pitch this workshop to my committee. 
I'll be putting material on disposable renewable assignment conversion into our faculty learning communities. I'm not behind. None of us are well-trained to be inspiring, amazing teachers. We cultivate it together. This is such a collaborative um, and community space. I think that that's right on. We're all in this together. We're all working together to um, come up with ways to be these inspiring, amazing teachers that we want to be. Ideas to reach students and faculty. And our last one, what excited you about the topics we covered today in this learning circle? Possibility of improving instruction, yay. The creative possibilities. Student driven, engaging, engaging students in new ways, concrete examples. I love how engaging this session was. I wonder how I can apply it in an in-person session. Uh, that's a great thing to think about. What's that transition going to look like? My potential as an advocate for OP, all of it coming at teaching from different angles, engaging students more robustly, the diversity of possible applications. That it is so manageable, not scary for faculty. I love all of these. These are these are so fun to read and um, get to see where you're engaged with all of this material and you know what's exciting to you. All right, so for week three, we will be talking about consent in the classroom, brave spaces, and care in the open. Make sure to do the pre-work, which is in the Canvas course. Um, and for week three, instructor participants should be ready to select to select which disposable assignment you're going to revise into a renewable assignment. And instructor support participants should be able to identify their audience for their digital learning object. Our tool next week is Hypothesis, so check out the links in the pre-work and in the Canvas course for more information on it. Uh, don't forget, you can reach out to me and we can set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting about your project or anything we've discussed so far in the learning circle. And thanks for a great session today, and I'll see you all next week. Um, so that was the learning circle um, experience. Thanks for that, Jamie. So uh, we're going to zoom out a little bit and talk about, so you experienced actually what a learning circle is like. I think the only difference is because we still have 50 plus people in the actual learning circle, there was plenty of opportunity to unmute if they wanted to. So we heard people's voices, but the use of mentee and the constant, like, let's discuss what we're learning is definitely a theme. Um, but let's look, uh, let's provide just kind of an overview of what's covered in each session. So you have um, the, the big picture of that. Session one is the kickoff, the learning circle structure and collaborative de definitions of open ped so that we provide a foundational understanding of open ped and showcase what it does as well as how it can be incorporated in the classroom. Session two is that disposable versus renewable, which you just went through. Session three, caring for students in the open, we strove to provide an overview of how consent functions in a classroom using open ped, as well as providing an exp uh, exploration of how to build a brave space. Session four, designing a course with open ped, we tried to develop an understanding of how important it is to start building open ped experiences that are accessible and scaffolded and that use universal design for learning. Um, and, you know, we would just wanted to make sure that we um, definitely hit appropriately scaffolding um, these, these experiences. Session five, we talked about open ped and DEI. So exploring the synergy between open ped and social justice, as well as to show how open ped can increase diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom. Um, and providing a brave space where we can talk about this and, and asking questions. Um, but we wanted, the, the, I think the takeaway for us was that starting small and building with intentionality when incorporating social justice is, is good. It's, it's okay to start small. Um, session six, tools showcase. We wanted to provide a showcase of tools commonly used in open ped. Um, and, you know, we wanted to enable folks who attended these to build their own kind of open ped toolkit. Um, and then session seven was show and tell where we provided a space for participants to showcase either their renewable assignment redesign or if they were um, a faculty partner, their learning object that was about open pedagogy. 
Um, we did, in fact, grant certificates to those who had to miss a session with a plausible excuse, but they did have to create their final renewable assignment or digital learning object that was about uh, OpenPED and shared it with everyone. Um, let's dig into a little bit about what we asked people regarding that final project, which we shared right up front in the first session so people could plan ahead. So the final project for instructors was to take an existing assignment and transform it into a renewable one, hence the practicing of open PED. Um, up front, though, we knew we had to define disposable and renewable, which is what Jamie just modeled to you. Um, we drew upon this uh, nice diagram. Um, and so we, you know, the steps are really chunked out as we scaffolded topics that related to the design of a renewable assignment. So by week six, um, they were actually on step uh, five. Sorry, my screen's covered here, finalizing and reclassifying the assignment. So we just kind of broke it down so it wasn't um, overwhelming. Um, faculty partners were to create a digital learning object that helps to explain open pedagogy. We felt like it was important for participants to understand right away what they were working toward. And then many of the lessons and the handouts and the activities intentionally scaffolded that information. Um, so that was helpful. And um, in a little bit, I think Jamie's going to show you what some of those projects look like. We were, I was like super impressed with what they created in seven weeks. We did address assessment, we did regular check-ins with Menometer, and we did a final survey to assess participant experience. So after experience in the learning circle, just curious, do you have any thoughts or questions about it? Please feel free to type in the chat. With seven sessions enough for folks to have something to show and tell, um, Jamie said it's a lot of information. Um, but all the attendees, you know, did were able to complete their final projects. Um, recommended time frame, we did, you know, sequential. We didn't take a break. We did seven weeks, one hour each session. Um, I think, I think if I were to do it again, I almost would want to slow down and maybe add a week. But then you're, you know, you're dealing with, well, will people not have enough time for two months? Is seven weeks just right? So I'll say we did it in seven weeks, but we had to go quickly. Um, let's see. Um, how did you successfully market this to faculty and staff? What percentage of faculty attended? What percentage um, completed the project? So we um, had it nine and nine, fac half faculty, fa half staff. What percentage of faculty attended? What percentage of faculty completed the projects? Sorry, I don't know the percentage that actually completed. Um, I just know that I felt like it was a robust group um, in terms of discussing and in terms of hearing both voices from faculty and faculty partners. Did you have situations where someone created a renewable assignment that wasn't really renewable? If so, how did you handle this? Um, that uh, we did it in the spring. I don't know, Jamie. Did we did we have anything that what didn't meet the parameters of the assignment? Uh, I don't think so. I think what we we, we really talked about was that. Um, there is this spectrum in between disposable to renewable, so maybe the assignment didn't um, hit on every single part of all of the sessions that we talked about, but it was a shift from their original assignment to add more student agency um, and add more opportunities for students to do something, and so it did still fall into that renewable category. Um, but maybe some were more renewable than others. And I think that that gets back into that discussion over the jargon and, you know, what what is really disposable versus renewable and how to really capture that. Um, how did we market this? How far ahead did we advertise, enroll, and remind? Um, so I think that's in the, uh, we're going to give you a link to all of it and um, um, how we marketed, I believe, is in there. Um, but we found that we had way more participants who wanted to participate than we had room for. Um, and so that always tells me, okay, this is probably something that people want. We used our Google group is how we advertised it. I think we made it, may have had some social media. No, actually we didn't. I think I said, hold off on the social media because we have too many applicants. So I don't think we did advertise it on social media. Um, 
Um, and we had a very simple application form just to ensure that people understood like, you know, can you attend all seven sessions? And we had like three people say no. So we're like, okay, well, you know, then we're going to go with the people who say they can attend. So we wanted to be really um, direct about what we were expecting. Um, I also worry about people creating renewable assignments that are either not accessible or incorporate practices that are problematic from a culturally inclusive perspective. Did you run into this? What kind of feedback did you offer for improvement? Um, I will let Jamie um, jump in, but I'll just say that I think Amanda did such a nice job of the brave spaces, of the inclusivity, of hitting head on social justice principles in DEI that I don't think we saw one project we were concerned about. Um, but also we always offered the one-on-one -on -one with Jamie, and then I know some people reached out directly to Amanda. So we did have those kind of, you know, hey, we're happy to hold your hand and answer any questions. Um, and I think if we had seen anything problematic, Jamie or Amanda would have reached out to the person to walk gently through that situation. Jamie, do you have a different take on that? Uh, no, I think that that's exactly right. I don't think we, <clears throat> excuse me, had any any issues with this. And I think because we had a whole session around uh, UDL for the accessibility of assignments and as well as the social justice and DEI um, and consent in the classroom that um, everyone really took it to heart what those sessions were about and how that really underpins everything that we're sort of working towards with this. Um, and like Tanya said, I did meet with several of our participants just one on one to talk about their assignments, but this was not um, necessarily anything that came up in those discussions. I think we we had a group that was really focused on uh, making sure that they took that information into consideration when planning these assignments and the, the digital learning objects. Um, we did not market open ped to students. This was um, only for faculty um, and faculty partners, so um, higher education professionals. Um, and you know, I think I think in the marketing material, we like added a brief definition, but this is obviously for people who had kind of a baseline understanding um, at least or interest in open pedagogy. Um, we felt like 18 was at the very top of what we could handle in terms of creating a safe community. And then, like I said earlier, I think we typically had eight to 10 people who actually showed up and that felt robust enough. So, um, but almost all of the research said 10 to 12 was ideal. Um, and let's see, what level of familiarity with open did you assume, if any? Um, Jamie, can you speak to that? Sure. I think we, uh, so we started with defining open pedagogy in that first session. Um, so I think we did have sort of a level of, um, they know OER maybe, and some some information about open education in general. Um, but we were really open to taking folks who were just really interested in open pedagogy, had sort of heard of what that term was, but didn't really have a baseline for um, how they would incorporate it into their own practice, um, to folks who had already sort of been doing this work. Um, and we wanted to have that that mix of um, folks with different um, levels of familiarity with it. Um, but I think the base level that we sort of assumed was um, some familiarity with being open, with using open education and OER. What time of the day did you offer the sessions? You know, I always am aware that I think in my time zone, so I think in my time zone, it was in the afternoon. Um, so I think it was like one to two, my time frame central. Um, I'm more of a morning person, so that's when I would prefer it. But we were aware of that some time zones that would be too early. So we just did our best to like pick the time zone that was sort of central and not being like at 8 a.m. for somebody. Um, and yeah, I don't as far as Jamie, as far as the seven sessions, like do you think that you would do that again? Seven, the seven weeks as opposed to going to an eighth week? Um, I think so. I think the the one consideration that I would think about is, uh, and you mentioned this earlier when we were talking about us having more open mic time. So maybe there's a week where it's more of just an open time for discussion. And um, if you can attend that particular week, that's great. But if not, that's sort of just a time for you to work on your project uh, before we go into like the show and tell week. Um, I, you know, we didn't, we don't know, Teresa, that's a good question. Do you find participants spread the word and grew interest around OER and OER PED after the learning circle? I think we did hear from 
maybe three, I don't exaggerate, maybe three of the participants that they were going to show this to someone at their institution or they were going to present this thing that they had created. So my impression, my strong impression is yes. Um, so I think anyone going through this experience, um, they all seemed like, oh, we're excited. We can do this, which was the most encouraging to me. Um, we did have a survey and the survey absolutely mirrored that, you know, that, yeah, people are excited. They felt like they could do this. They could start where they needed to start and go from there. Um, but we didn't, you know, we haven't checked back in with, with those folks. So, so good question. Anything else before we move on? These are great questions. And I think too, the beauty of openly licensed curriculum is that you can take it, make it your own. You want it to be longer, make it longer. You want it to be shorter, you can do that too. So, you know, we are just providing a jumping off point. But as you will see when we share the links, Amanda did an extremely thorough and comprehensive job of providing you everything that you might need. So that'll be fun to give that to you later today. Um, the idea of a learning, oh, no. Um, okay. I think that's it. So we are going to take just a five minute break, but please come back because Jamie's going to show you some of the examples of final projects that we received. And then of course, we're going to equip you with all of the good stuff that we've shared all throughout today. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the uh, learning circle projects that we um, actually had our participants create. And so one of the great things about having this mixed group of participants of uh, both instructors and instructor support folks uh, was that the project examples span both those digital learning objects and renewable assignments. Uh, so this first one is a digital learning object that was created by Amanda Gray from KPU. Um, and so we, we talked about this a little bit in the session about the spectrum of disposable versus renewable assignment. Um, this was a discussion that we had during, during the actual learning circle session on disposable versus renewable assignments. And Amanda took that and created this infographic that really captured that discussion and that conversation. Um, and she also wrote a really great blog post for KPU teaching and learning about open pedagogy. Um, and it's a really wonderful resource that really gets at um, some of those nuances that we've talked about um, with regard to renewable assignments and sort of the spectrum that assignments lay on. Uh, this digital learning object was created by Leanne Urasaki at Hawaii Community College, and she created this professional development workshop to give to her colleagues. So she sort of took the uh, open pedagogy um, a, a session and then the disposable versus renewable assignment session and put together this really excellent starting a uh, starting point for librarians at her own institution um, and teaching faculty alike so they could become more familiar with open pedagogy and renewable assignments. Now, this is a, uh, an actual pedagogical example of a renewable assignment. So History of Science was created by Dr. Lauren Woolsey, a professor at Grand Rapids Community College, and her assignment gives students choice over their project in both licensing and submission format, as well as the topic. And so it also makes a contribution to the broader work of astronomy and who is included in that canon of astronomers and ancient cultures that are studied. And she drew on all of the different learning circle sessions to really center student agency, students as knowledge creators and student belonging. Um, and this last example, this is another pedagogical example of that renewable assignment. And so this assignment was created by Professor Kokila Ravi at Atlanta Metropolitan College. Um, and it also focuses on student choice and student voice in licensing and sharing. And so this seminar is a required course for students at um, Atlanta Metropolitan College. And so really creating this renewable assignment has a huge impact um, on all of the students at that institution. And so Professor Ravi actually incorporated FLIP, which was one of the learning tools that we had talked about and used during the learning circles. Um, to give students the choice on how to submit their reflection. Um, and previously, students did not um, share that beyond uh, just their classroom, outside of the classroom, or with any of the other students in the course. And so this actually gave them the opportunity to share it with their, their peers and promote their reflection on the college website if they wanted to. Um, and it really gave, gives her students the opportunity to share this beyond this one particular course. 
And so we talked about the curriculum. And so I want to do a little bit closer look at what you um, can actually get with all this curriculum, where you find all the resources and how everything is available to you. So the curriculum for the learning circle is meant to be flexible and easily customizable. We've talked a little bit about how you could extend the sessions if you wanted to or cut it down. You can really pick and choose which pieces work best for your institution or your participant or your participant group, or you can run the whole learning circle exactly um, as designed. Uh, since each week's topic is centered around different facets of open pedagogy, you could extend the number of sessions to, to include any topic following that basic session structure that we went through. So you could add a session using the opening activities, the discussion, the closing activities, and focus on maybe o OER definitions or just a grounding of open as that first session before moving into what is open pedagogy. Or you could build a session around Creative Commons licensing before moving into session three, which is consent in the classroom. Um, and so all of this is available to you. Uh, and so here's where you access it. Uh, first, there is the Canvas course which is broken down into the seven session modules, as well as the modules on how to use the curriculum and facilitator resources. The facilitator resources then links out to the Google folder, which contains all of the curriculum. So this is where you'll find the slide decks, the participant handouts, instructions for the final projects, email templates, um, pretty much everything you saw in the learning circle session and more. The tools documentation is also linked in the tools section of each module and the Google folder, but we also have a separate link in here as well for you. And I um, thank you, Tanya, for putting those links in the chat. And the tools documentation covers all of the weekly tools that were discussed, um, plus more that actually fit into the different use cases that we determined in the learning circle. And each tool is also rated on a difficulty scale of one to five. Um, so you have an idea of what that baseline level of technology technological ease needs to be for somebody who's getting started with these. Um, and it has links to getting started documentation. Thanks, Teresa. That's exactly the reaction we were hoping. <laughs> so uh, in terms of getting started with an open pedagogy learning circle, uh, just a few considerations. You'll want to read through the how to use curriculum, browse the Canvas um, site, decide who your audience is. Is it a mixed audience or do you just want faculty members? Uh, put together your call for participants could be targeted. Um, to a specific department or college, or it might be general. Um, decide how many sessions you'll have, your selection criteria, how long your learning circle or how large your learning circle is. Um, 12 to 15 is what we came up with. Where you'll meet virtually in person or hybrid, a learning circle certainly could be in person. Um, decide whether you'll have participants complete a learning circle project or, you know, if you'll be offering a certificate of completion and then release your call into the wild. Um, you'll want to think a little bit about tools, you know, what do you have available, Zoom, Hypothesis, H5P, Google Suite, Mentimeter, um, build your sessions around what's readily available at your institution so that you'll have centralized support. Um, and then pick your favorite way to poll participants um, after seeing um, Amanda model Mentimeter, and I just was like, I'm a fan. So I've enjoyed that type of engagement, but it could be through Poll Everywhere, Cahoots or Zoom or something else. Um, in terms of what's in a session, these are the items or activities that are in each session. You've got the temperature check, you know, how's everybody feeling through Mentimeter, an opening activity with a fun question, a presentation of basic concepts, some type of discussion of those concepts, a temperature check at the end. How are you feeling? If you know if everybody was overwhelmed, maybe we need to stop and address that. A closing activity. Um, you know, what's one thing people are taking away? Um, and a type of wrap up. Details for next week. Assignment reminders and any sort of pre work information that you might need. Um, and now Jamie's going to share some of the lessons that we learned, which it always happens when you pilot something. Uh, when we piloted this learning circle. Thanks, Tanya. And so I think we sort of mentioned some of these already, but I just want to re reiterate um, some of the big takeaways that we had. Uh, so the first one um, is setting community norms in that first session is really important. Um, making sure everyone knows what is expected, expected of them and how to kindly and compassionately take care of themselves and interact with their colleagues. 
Um, and attrition is real. Uh, we talked about that a little bit. We had accepted 18 folks into um, into the group, and then we had only about eight to 10 um, at each session. So expect drop off in attendance and you know, take that into consideration as you decide how many folks you're going to accept into your own learning circle. Um, also decide what will be required to obtain a certificate of completion if you choose to offer one. In our case, uh, certificates were offered as long as the final project was submitted and showcased, um, even if the person didn't necessarily attend all of the, all of the sessions. Um, and for us, it worked really well to have that mixed group of instructors and instructor support folks. Um, so both groups were able to contribute to the discussions and engage with each other by offering different perspectives and experiences, uh, especially in the tool talk section of each session. Um, and finally, um, as both Tanya and I have mentioned, all of this material is openly available for you to use as is or adapt and remix in any way that you see fit for your institutional context. Uh, so you might want to change the learning tools you talk about talk about based on what is available at your own institution. Um, or again, maybe you need to start with some more basic definitions of open and OER before moving into open pedagogy. Um, or you may want to add that free session where your participants can just bring up any topic to discuss. With this curriculum, you can really make it your own. Um, and again, we want to take a second to thank our OEN fellow, Amanda Larson, for really creating this excellent curriculum for the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle. Uh, so we have done a lot today. Um, we've gone over a lot of information, starting with the intro to Open Pedagogy Workshop, um, facilitating and experiencing the Open Pedagogy Learning Circle. Um, so we just want to check in again um, after seeing everything from today. Uh, how are you feeling? I learned a lot and I'm still learning. Always good. Like an open pedagogy master. That's excellent. I think I'm still even in the I learned a lot and I'm still learning. Um, every time Tanya and I work with open pedagogy, there's always something else to think about or consider. Um, so I think that's the perfect space to be. As long as you're curious and engaged with it, um, I think that's the right path. Jamie, before we move on, um, sure. can you address Hope's questions? Are we able to import the Canvas course content into their own Canvas? Do you, do you know the answer to that? I think you should be able to. It is an open course on Canvas. So if you have, um, you can you should be able to put it into the, the Canvas Commons um, and just get the cartridge for it. Um, but I can also double check on that and make sure that we get that information to you. Is Trisha's question more of the same? Can I export it and import it? Yes. Yeah, the same question. Yeah. Um, I will double check and make and make sure that that is possible. Thanks, Trisha. It shouldn't, there shouldn't be any login for it. It is um, openly available, but we will make sure that all the links are correct when all of this um, gets sent back out to you. So you should be able to have access to all of it. Let me make sure that I, I'm going to put it back in the chat. And then Jamie, if you want to, there we go. Um, yeah, let's, we're not going to do a, a breakout. We know it's later in the day and we have, it's a three hour session, but we're wondering how you might use these materials, what we've missed that you know you will need to successfully implement open ped or anything else. Um, so Jamie, if you could go to the, for the, the last slide, please. That actually says small group breakout. Yeah, there yep. you go. So any responses, um, any responses to this curriculum or the entire day, open ped workshop and learning circle, anybody want to share? Um, here's how I'm feeling. Here's what we still need. I don't think this would work because, or I think this would work great because feel free to put anything you'd like in the chat. We'll just take a second. I'm going to let Jamie address H5P. So we did actually have in one of the sessions, we used H5P as one of the learning tools that we explored for that week. Um, so it's definitely possible, uh, depending on um, whether you're going to follow the curriculum exactly as is, um, to just use, the, use it the way H5P was already incorporated into it. 
Um, but there's also other ways you could build um, multiple activities around H5P and the different uh, learning circle sessions if you wanted to incorporate uh, more into sort of the discussion um, areas, the discussion section of the session. Um, that would be another way to incorporate it, but it is actually built into the curriculum. So you sort of have a starting point there. And it also depends on your institution too. So um, Amanda at Ohio State has access to H5P that she was able to build it in. Not every institution does. So that might be something that you need to, to change or you know adapt for your own institution. Um, yes, I think if, um, Pelney Watch Party, um, if indeed, I were offering this to a particular institution, I would love to incentivize um, participation because I think we'd get more participants. Um, you know, for us, it's just our entire community, so that's not possible. But if I were at my former institution, I would try to see if we could um, provide some financial incentives. So I think that's a, a great suggestion. Um, I think it would be great to put together a session in my school's teaching conference or our lunch and learns, awesome. Um, so pleased to have this structure to build from. Good, Melanie, I'm glad. Right, you don't have to build it from scratch. You have something to start with. I think that's um, helpful. As a librarian, I think this would work better for me if I partnered with a faculty member to work on presenting open ped to other faculty. Um, yes, Emily, and that is why moving forward, Jamie and I will be there together co-facilitating. Um, I mean, I'm staff, but I also teach every semester. So I think there is something in that faculty librarian um, collaboration that is really synergistic. I agree. Um, I think this might be something to explore partnering with other schools and our consortium for the first few years so we have enough participants for a full, full group. Um, yeah, again, I don't have a really a, a good sense of at an institution, if you offered it, would you get so many applicants that you couldn't even take them all? That was us. Um, but if it was just institutionally, maybe you'd be in that um, in that boat. My own concern is that faculty might wonder why they even need to partake in a learning circle here at the college. A lot of people at my college seem to respond to incentives, but we have limited funding in my department as is. Yes, I understand. Um, and whenever I was in that position in my former um, role as a dean, I would try to scare up enough money to have a coffee bar. And that might sound funny, but coffee with all the fixings. And I'm telling you, I, that would do it. Like a coffee bar? People would get all excited about that. Um, you know, so digital certificates or a little bit of food or a coffee bar or, you know, even the, hey, an instructional designer and librarian are going to be there to assist you with any questions. Sometimes that was enough. Um, but I hear you. Um, money is scarce. My colleague is doing a series on making equity-minded research assignments, and I want to see if I can weasel in. Love that. As a doctoral student whose instructor used renewable assignments, I can 100% say it motivated me, built my portfolio, and I'm pumped to help faculty with awareness and ideas for use. Teresa, I just want to quote you and put that on our website. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Melissa, we're seeking to develop more structured support for OER development and Z degree stuff. I'm thinking about this training as a terrific part of faculty author onboarding. Wonderful. I built an active workshop for transforming an assignment only, so very happy to do that better and have the rest of it. Wonderful, Trisha. And then another useful product might be a sample paragraph that could be included with tenure promotion documents. Absolutely. Yep. Perfect. So helpful. Thank you so much for sharing all of those wonderful things. Um, now let's look at some of the stuff we're uh, going to be equipping you with. Um, I'm going to make sure that I've got the links copied here. Um, as an educator, I feel like, you know, you get a car and you get a car. <laughs> um, I don't know if you feel quite like that, but still, I'm hoping that the open pedagogy workshop with speaker notes, the learning circle curriculum with explanation, the Canvas co course, the video, and then this particular slide deck with robust speaker notes that you can throw out or adapt as you so choose. I hope all of that will be helpful to you. Um, I'm going to post this stuff in the in the chat. If you have trouble with any of it, uh, you know, of course, let us know. And um, and now uh, Jamie's going to talk a little bit about the Open Ped portal. 
Yes, this is something that we're really excited about. Um, Tanya mentioned it in, in the very beginning um, that we've actually created this repository and referatory for real life examples of renewable assignments and case studies, student work product and teaching and learning resources about open pedagogy. Uh, so the portal can be browsed by discipline. So if you're looking something for something specific to your discipline, like Tanya said, she would be probably looking for literature examples. Uh, you could always go through the disciplines. You can also search by keywords. Um, and if you or anyone you know has a renewable assignment or some type of case study and student work product, um, or they've you've developed as a librarian maybe some type of teaching and learning resource around open pedagogy, there's a submission form directly on the portal so that we can add it for you. Um, so it's starting out small with some work featured from both the certificate and open educational practices folks and the learning circle final projects. Um, but we're really hoping that in time it will become this robust directory of open pedagogy work um, and really be a place to learn from, adapt from, remix from, and really share all of that work that so many of us are contributing. So thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if today's session sparked ideas, questions, or thoughts, we encourage you to continue the conversation with your fellow community members in the OEN in Gade, or the OEN Google group. But we're also going to have a space for continued discussion on this topic at today's Engage Encore session, which is happening from 2.30 to 3.15 Central Time. So come back if you want to talk more about learning circles or open pedagogy or publishing or whatever it is, come back today um, from 2.30 to 3.15 to, to talk with us. Finally, we want to remind you that this session has been recorded and it will be shared with you via email and posted on the community hub in the coming weeks. Slides and transcripts will also be linked. Um, we thanks, uh, thank you um, for joining us, and we want to know if you have any questions um, that we have not answered. Also, I'm going to put a survey in the chat. We would love it if you would give us some feedback about what worked for you, what didn't, what you're still hoping for. Um, any questions, feel free to unmute or put it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Emily, I think that's a great idea. If members of the OEN were running the learning circle across the same time frame, I wonder if it would be interesting to spend some time together to occasionally discuss and debrief as facilitators. I love that. Um, this is all about community and what you need and what's working and what's not. So um, it would be really helpful, I think, to me and I assume um, to Jamie as co-facilitators to be meeting with other folks um, to be, you know, talking through what's what's working. I think that's great. Thank you. Jamie, I'm not sure as to Trisha's question. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that it gets into the com the Canvas Commons um, and so that link will be provided when all of these links go out again. Um, and we'll also look into the, uh, the cartridge as well um, for the person who was asking about that too. Jenny, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. This was going to take a long time to type, so I just thought I would ask it. Um, so I know that none of this work is very linear, but I kind of think as we start out, like we've started with um, the OER review workshops and next are looking at like mini grants, um, you know, and further down the road would be like creation and publishing. Where do you, so that's sort of my linear look at OER work, um, where do you see this open pedagogy work? I mean, if you were to kind of like put it in, would it be kind of akin to more advanced like creation, publishing, you know, a library imprint, that kind of thing, or could it sort of go anywhere if that question makes sense? I think it's an excellent question. And I'll say that I don't know that I've thought that deeply about in the spectrum of OER, where would this, you know, of open education, where would this go? But I will say after seeing the learning circle in action, that I don't know necessarily that you would need, oh, we got to do the adoption workshop first before. Do you know what I mean? I feel like this mm -hmm. is more about transforming curriculum um, and getting together and talking through it. I felt like it it just felt safe. People were speaking and, and asking good questions. So I don't know that it would have to be chronological necessarily. I think you could plug the learning circle in wherever you wanted to. Um, 
I personally kind of would like people to go through the open pedagogy workshop first and then go to the learning circle, the linear need in me. But even that I don't think is necessary because I think Amanda did such a nice job providing that foundational understanding of open education, OER and open educational practices. Um, so I don't consider uh, this learning circle necessarily advanced, um, but anybody disagree with me? Jamie, anyone here disagree? No, I don't. I think I think you're right. There are certainly pieces that touch on some of these other areas within the open ed space, but I think you're right that this is this can be its own sort of foundational uh, course, if you will, um, and, and its own thing versus having to follow the adoption workshop or even the intro to ped workshop. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. Thank you so much. Great question. Um, anyone else with a question? Feel free to unmute or type in the chat. Looks like we're going to give you a few minutes back in your day. Hopefully that's um, okay with you. But remember that we do have Engage Encore coming up at 2.30. Something about, yeah, evidently the link is asking for a login. We will check on that and make sure to fix it if indeed something is wrong. So sorry about that. Any other questions, comments? Again, if you wouldn't mind filling out our survey, it will only help us to get better and to provide things in the future that meet your needs. So thanks, Mandy. Thanks, Jeannie. If there are no other questions, then we will conclude. But thank you so much for hanging in there. I know this is long. Uh, we appreciate it. And we were excited to share it with you. So thank you so much. <laughs>